What's going on, everyone? My name is Joe Cucciarelli. I'm here with my co-host, Rachel, and welcome to the first episode of Overserve. We're going to be speaking about everything from Wimbledon to Netflix dropping Breakpoint, the second part of the Netflix series, and all the other major top tennis stories. And how can we not get right into it and start with Djokovic winning his 23rd major? So, Rachel, my question is, is he your GOAT? <laughs> Uh, the GOAT debate. Okay, let's think about it. So when I think of the GOAT debate, I think of basketball and I think of Michael Jordan and LeBron James. And the thing with that is it's two different areas, two different time frames, two different decades. But in tennis, we've got these three guys who are all in the same time period, all having the same amazing results in tennis. And uh, on paper and statistically, Novak Djokovic would be considered the GOAT. He's got the most Grand Slam titles. He's got the most titles. He's uh, tied with the ATP Needle Finals with Roger. He doesn't have the Olympics like Rafa, Rafa does, but uh, he, you know, on paper is the GOAT. But he's not my GOAT. My GOAT is Rafael Nadal. And uh, I think a lot more goes into the GOAT debate than just uh, statistics and analytics. I think that you, the way that you're loved in the tennis community, the positive impact that you have on you know, everyone involved in tennis and sports is what the GOAT debate is about. And uh, for me, it's Rafael Nadal, then Roger Federer, and then Novak Djokovic. No, so I'm with you because Rafa is my GOAT 100%. So my next question is, is that a little bit of an asterisk or a little mark that Rafa wasn't <laughs> in this major? Is it, you know, is it kind of like, does this one, not that it doesn't count because he, he had a hell of a tournament. It was unreal. Top tier tennis on clay, one of the best. But does it really count without Rafa? Is it like, is there something there, a little side note that Rafa was out once again in this major? I mean, listen, like Roger Federer is retired. Rafa is injured. I think that it's fair game. Like, I, I think that there wasn't some kind of crazy instance that took Rafa from the game. He is not on a beach somewhere where chilling and relaxing. He is recovering. He's working hard to come back on tour. And um, yeah, he's he's definitely going to come back and doing all that he can to come back for 2024 season. So no, I wouldn't put some kind of special uh, thing on that for, for him. No, absolutely. Especially him beating Alcaraz, too. I mean, you can't discredit them. The terror that Alcaraz has been on this year has been incredible. So the fact that he's still doing what he's doing at this age and at this point in his career is definitely unreal. So getting into it again, it's crazy to think about how at this point last year, Rafa wasn't even beaten yet in a major. And he's missing another one as we get into Wimbledon. And it's something where it's just, you know. It's such a great tournament. It's so prestigious. It's so special, you know, for everything from the dress code uh, to the grass uh, court. It's just it's special. It's a special place. It's one of the most prominent majors for a reason that makes total sense. Um, but the one thing that really is special, well, not special, but somebody we are getting back, not totally on the tier of Rafa, but totally up there and great for the game is Nick Kyrgios. So it's something is he, you know, I, he excites me, loved him on break point, you know, love what he does for the game excitement wise. What, how do you feel about that? Yeah, no, it's so great to have Nick back uh, competing. And as we know, he's unbelievable on grass court. Uh, I think he said something today where he's like, I've done everything in my career. I've proven myself. I've won a Grand Slam doubles title. I've made it to the finals of a Grand Slam singles title. You know, there's nothing more I need to prove. And I think that that mindset of like, I have nothing to lose. I'm just going to go out there and play. Uh, I think that's dangerous for other players. So uh, I think that's really exciting. If he, I was thinking about him, I'm like, okay, he really has, you know, two or three real competitors, people competition this tournament. If he's playing his game, his best game, and he's in his like mentally really, really good headspace, and that's Novak Djokovic in probably the quarters. Uh, and if he gets past that, it would be Carlos Alcaraz in the final. But his other biggest opponent is himself and his uh, his mental game. So, um, I mean, he is unbelievable on grass court, like I said. And uh, I think if he shows up and it's just, you know, in his really focused, focused mindset that we've seen him play before, uh, you know, not as not super often, but we've seen it. Uh, I think that he could be really successful this tournament. No, absolutely. Like you said, looking at his drawer, like, like you said, once he got to Alcaraz or Djokovic at the very end, it's not the craziest thing. I think he starts with David Goffin, um, which had a really great tournament last year. And it's just somebody he hasn't had been super consistent this year. Um, so I think if Kyrgios, you know, gets a little momentum, he he's just a vibe guy. So like you said, if he's in his right headspace and, you know, things are going well that day for him and he feels good and he's you know kind of doing his thing, not playing FIFA uh, till three, four in the morning. It's, it's one of those things where, it's, you know, he could be anybody on any day. So I'm really excited to see him back. 
Yeah. And you know what, if I, I made picks for this tournament and, um, you know, I chose Carlos Alcaraz to win. I think a big part of it though, was what side of the draw Nick Kyrgios landed on. And he ended up on that second half with Novak Djokovic. I think that that's going to be, you know, obviously a rematch of the finals from last year, which was a really unbelievable match, um, you know, taking place, like I said, I believe in the quarters. Um, I think that that's going to be a really challenging match for both of them. And, uh, you know, they're both, uh, Djokovic is, you know, obviously in incredible shape. Uh, he'll be able to bounce back for the next two matches. Um, but um, I think that, you know, whoever faces off against Carlos, Carlos is a phenom. He is just a different kind of athlete and uh, a once in a lifetime kind of athlete. And uh, I think that he's pretty unstoppable. He's already proven himself on grass court. He hasn't had a lot of experience, but he just won the title at Queens club, which has got to give him that, you know, really, really strong confidence coming into Wimbledon. So I'm going with Carlos on this one. No, absolutely. It makes total sense too. And like you said, I think what happened at Roland Garros definitely lit that fire for him, which I think, you know, every athlete needs because he was at that point where he was on the tear. You know, he was just he was being dominant the way he was playing. And I think the odds going into that Alcaraz was the favorite going up against Djokovic. And obviously, I think that lit a fire to Djokovic being like, how can I do this for that long? And still, you know, this young kid, how can I still be uh, the underdog in this situation? Um, so I think, like you said, that last tournament that Alcaraz just recently played, won that on grass. I think it got him some more momentum going. I think Roland Garros definitely lit a fire under his butt. That's kind of, you know, I think he's locked in. Not that he's ever not locked in, but I think more than usual. Um, so it's I, I'm copying you with Rafa being my go. I'm going to copy you again with Alcaraz being <laughs> um, the winner of Wimbledon at the end of this. My dark horse, not even dark horse, um, but looking at the draw, I think Medvedev, um, if he, you know, when the, some of those matches go the right way, I think he's somebody you just – you never know what type, if it's not on a hard court, you never know what type of day he's going to have. And that's what makes you so nervous with him. Um, but dark horse wise and not even a dark horse, you know, if he gets hot at the right time, you could always see Medvedev or I would love to see Sinner hasn't been playing great. My fellow Italian I would love to see him. I heard that the, uh, the carrot guy, the carrot boys, carrot guys uh, will <laughs> be out guys there. Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> out there at Wimbledon, which, and that's the thing too. That'll be interesting. Like we said, it's a very prominent um, special tournament, different from other ones where it's, you know, guys like Kyrgios, you saw it in break point. It's like, that's not a place for him. And that's, I think he thrives in that element in such a special tournament. And, you know, I think it, it, he brings a great element to the game. I think the dress code, just so many things make Wimbledon great. So now that we're done with the predictions for the men's and how we think that side of the tournament's going to go, I just wanted to ask you, you know, because it's another major part. What do you think about the women's? Who's your prediction to win the uh, Wimbledon on the women's side? Okay, so it hasn't been done since 2015, 2016, Serena Williams, a player defending their Wimbledon title. I think that that's going to happen this year with Alina Rybakina. I love this girl. I've met her a couple of times. She's the sweetest, most innocent girl. Um, she's so powerful and just so uh, even killed on court. And I love that about her. And I think of the moment last year when she won the Wimbledon title and she showed like zero emotion. I'm like, girl, you just won Wimbledon. And it looked like any other point to her. And I, I love that about her. I think that she's going to defend her title this year. I, I think she's a strong enough player. And uh, yeah, I think she's got it this year. No, that makes total sense. I mean, she's been having a great year, like you said, has a great serve, a lot of tools to her game that could, you know, show exactly why she could repeat, you know, if she gets hot and, you know, finish this and repeat, which will be, like you said, for the first time in a ton of years. But when you brought her up, something made me think of her sister that I've seen things on social media that she's been posting and they're hysterical. I don't know if you've seen them, but uh, Alina's, uh, yeah, Alina's sister has been like posting things of her sister and it's absolutely hysterical. Really? I have not seen that. No, you got to check it out. Really funny. It's, it's, it's funny because you're like, yeah, she shows no emotion. And her sister is posting a bunch of stuff on social media of her like uh, behind the scenes. And they've been really funny. So you definitely have to check that out. But uh, going back to predictions, uh, I definitely think, like you said, that's a great pick. It's hard, I think, not to go with her or Iga, um, who's been having a great year. You know, I just I feel like right now it's there. They're at the top, you know, and then you have Sabalenka right behind her, which would make sense. Gets out at the right time. Or uh, like I said, my dark horse would have to be uh, Mariah Zachary. Uh, You know, I think she's a great um, uh, grass court player. It's something where she's starting to get hot. I feel like get some confidence back in the sense winning a few matches before getting into Wimbledon. Uh, you know, I think mentally she still needs to get over that stride of not winning that uh, Grand Slam. But I think she's right there. And I could see, you know, if she you know gets the confidence, gets a couple wins going in, um, could make maybe a Dark Horse run. So hopefully the Netflix curse, because that was a big thing early on. Hopefully that it won't. Was. 
that was huge seeing it like it was day by day as soon as it came out it was you know rolling it, it was just you would see it it made total sense and it would happen it wasn't just like oh one or two people were on the show it's like they were going down by flies it was like if you were on break point you would like <laughs> next match you were done for um so hopefully that doesn't keep going uh, but yeah looking forward both the men's and the women's side seeing who takes it home but I got to bring up something that is so just like the opposite of tradition that Wimbledon is doing this year. And I don't know if you saw this, but they are introducing an AI technology to do some commentary this season. And it is blowing my mind. Um, you know, I think that it's really cool that, uh, you know, we've advanced with technology so far, but I keep thinking about it. I'm like, okay, so they're doing, um, I guess, some kind of commentary and some kind of like play analysis and uh, so I think about commentary and it's a lot of like nuances and strategies and tennis terminology that could a, you know, AI technology or like computer or whatever generated thing, could they pick up on that? Or is it going to be so high level? Like, is it going to just be like, and now Novak Djokovic hit an ace? Or is it going <laughs> to be like, and Novak Djokovic just hit an ace and he defended his uh, and break point and now he's going on a server deuce and it was to the t up the backhand to the yeah. backhand the the opponent's weakness and now or is it going to be you know more uh detailed like that and uh if it is then uh, i think that we are all at risk for losing our jobs <laughs> no absolutely and that's the thing too like you said it'll be interesting to see because you can see what you know different video games with the announcing and things like madden and mlb the show i mean they get it pretty right. pretty up to point where it's scary if something happens, a great diving play. Not they're not like, oh, it's a great diving play. Like, oh, two yeah. can blah blah blah. Makes a great diving play. And you're like, wow. I mean, it's it's just like you said, crazy. But my one thing with that, if it does not go well right away, I'm gonna start striking that you and our good friend Ruskin isn't up there <laughs> in Wimbledon. Uh, you know, coming to doing some commentary for them. So a a um, AI better be on its shit, or I'm gonna be coming for them and which <laughs> Rachel and Ruskin. Yeah. Can you imagine like AI having Gruskin's voice? <laughs> I can't even sometimes it, like Gruskin, Gruskin having his own voice. For those who don't know, Gruskin, <laughs> fellow colleague, works with us over at Cracked Rackets. Great guy, has a bunch of podcasts. You guys go check him out. Absolutely. And yeah, you mentioned Breakpoint, as we know, uh, season two just launched. What are your initial thoughts on that? I mean, I, I love anything like that where it's like, I feel like tennis doesn't get enough commentary and or you know from the viewership from everybody especially in the united states so i feel like it's something i was watching that actually with my girlfriend and she doesn't know really anything about tennis besides when i'm watching it with her and she was like it's like when you get to know somebody it's really interesting right it's like it's when you know because if you watch them on the court yeah the guy's extremely talented but when you see the personality when you see the behind the scenes i just think it brings another element to the table same thing with you know curios is a really misunderstood guy where it's like yeah. If you're not the biggest or if you're more of an older tennis fan, you don't see you don't understand maybe why he acts the way he does. Or it's he loves playing tennis, but he loves doing other things in life, too. You know, when he's locked in, he's locked in. But when he's doing other things, he likes to enjoy everything, his friends, his family. Um, so I think seeing that for some people is really good. I think the bit um, going into the U.S. Open with uh, Tiafo was awesome. You know, seeing the background where he came from. Um you know, what he had to get through to kind of get to where he is in his career in that special moment uh, last year, taking down Rafa um, and kind of what it did for him in his career and how he's, you know, been on a nice little tear after that, getting into the top 10. Um, so there's been a lot that really has everything on uh, on Jabor, uh, getting to the point and losing last year, um, obviously disappointed. And, you know, could see she's excited to get back into it this year and hopefully, you know, make another deep run at uh, Wimbledon. Uh, but just a lot of behind the scenes of things you normally don't see if you're not, a, you know, a diehard tennis fan or you're not looking at it every day. And Because it's not like ESPN. You don't go on ESPN and a lot of those stories aren't headlining, which is extremely unfortunate. Um, so unless you're diving and really looking for those topics and clips and everything, it's kind of like things like this was a great viewpoint of where, you know, not every day tennis fans can go and see it. Right. No, you're exactly right. I think it gives that introspective look into the lives of these athletes. It really focuses on specifically the mental, uh, you know, struggles that they go with being on tour, that day to day life, the travel, all the tournaments they go to, the relationships with their team, their coaches, their significant others. And, uh, and I think that, you know, like you said, it really gives, um, you know, average sports fans and people that might not know a lot of, about a tennis, like a good, you know, real look into their lives and behind the scenes. And uh, I think that's really cool. And another thing that you touched on is um, how it really highlights these athletes' personal lives. I mean, like you said, Nick Kyrgios in um, 
you know, a lot, I guess, of the world is kind of considered that villain of tennis. But to me, he's got one of the biggest hearts on tour. And this show really kind of highlights that. It shows the kind of person he is. He's a great guy. He's sensitive. He's got a big heart. He loves his family. He loves, you know, helping people. And I, I think that that's huge to really showcase how great these players on tour are. are so. Yeah, no, and that's the thing too. Anytime you're on TV where it's, I don't know, it's not scripted. I mean, it, any type of documentary when they're with you 24 seven, you don't know what right. they show. And they could have very easily, you know, going, doing things a certain way, giving Kyrgios a bad edit. And I feel like they did the total opposite. They gave him a great, you know, an edit that shows him, not even a great edit. They just showed him for what he is, you know, which is a very entertaining, very talented, special tennis star, uh, which was awesome to see. Big fan of his. So it was good to see that. Um, but it also, it's like, it's, it shows things, but if you were watching last year in that uh, match with Kyrgios and Tispas, it's sh- like, you kind of knew what was going on, but hearing them talk about it behind the scenes, because you could also see it's like, Kyrgios was like, yeah, I don't give a shit what he thinks and what he's going through, like get through it, finish the match. And Tispas was like, you could see it. And he, he spoke about it, that it was affecting him. And that just shows, you know, the type of player Kyrgios is that, you know, he does some of those things to get in his player's head and it does work. And it's interesting to hear some of the guys behind the scenes. Cause yeah, you know, like if you're a sports fan, you could see, you could be like, Oh, he's getting a little shaken up but to actually hear him speak about it and be like, you know what? I wasn't as locked in as I should have been. It's definitely interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. And another kind of instance similar to that was when, um, you know, Isla was about to face off against Serena Williams and she was watching Annette, uh, Kontavitz pro, uh, press conference and Annette was crying and um, it was just because she was so overwhelmed with how one-sided the crowd was for that match um, you know at the U.S. Open and I thought that was uh, it really gave that kind of inside look that these uh, these players what they have to face and and what they're going up against mentally when they you know play top players or play rivals so uh, it is interesting. Absolutely. And the one thing that did catch me, not off guard, but I wish they did a little bit different. So when that last match that you were speaking about, um, when Isla lost that first, um, she lost that first game of the third set, they skipped right over that, which I thought they'd be like, she's like, oh, no, in the sense, like it's happening again. And they would get into that. And then she broke um, Serena the next uh, game right after and then went on the tear, ended up, you know, going away with that um, set and winning the match. But it's like in the sense Breakpoint does a great job of highlighting key points, but at the same time, you're not going to get the actual experience as you're watching the entire match. So that's why I think Breakpoint is a great, in a sense, introduction and for behind the scenes. But I also, I, there's no like replacement for watching the actual match, you know, going through yeah. the highs and lows because there's so much. They do a great job of highlighting a lot of the highs, <laughs> a lot of the lows, but you know, it's, they get, they're doing an hour. They're fitting several mat. They're fitting a, like a whole tournament of the key people that highlight yeah. in an hour. So they do a great job, but there's no, you know, you can't replicate, duplicate, actually no. walk the entire match. I mean, I agree. You know, I got to give them credit though. They did come kind of close. I actually was at that match, Serena uh, versus Isla. And I think like, I was so nervous. I think I was like, <laughs> like <laughs> five or six, like honey deuces and just keep like coming to try and like calm down and chill out. Um, so I, you know, watching that break point episode, I was kind of reliving those moments yeah. and uh, yeah, it was still nerve wracking, but, uh, but really fun to watch. Nice. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, you being there, if you were getting nervous, I'm sure you were thrown back. I don't know if they were uh, maybe different, maybe tequila this time, what you were drinking on this time at your apartment where you were watching it. But it's good to right. know obviously they did uh, justice of the match getting across. If you were re- reliving the emotions again, just watching it, like you said, they did a great job. So speaking of behind the scenes and some of these players' lives, I think there's been nothing that's taken over the, you know, tennis media and the spotlight uh, more than the whole relationship and, you know, breaking news. I know not anymore. A couple of weeks ago of Tispas and Bedosa, uh, definitely crazy in the sense of tennis powerhouse or tennis relationship powerhouse. Um, so it, it, it's wild. I've seen more Tispas and Bedosa content than like content for Roland Garros or uh, content for Wimbledon. So it's been crazy the way they've, you know, taken over, especially social media. I know. I am telling you, move over, Elena Svitolina and Gail Monfils. Tennis has a new it couple, and it's Paula Bedosa and Stefanos Tsitsipas, and I am here for it. Uh, you know, in tennis, we've had um, you know a bunch of cute couples, Kleisters and Hewitt, uh, Sharapova and Dimitra. We've had Isla and Mateo, but now it's all about Stefanos and Paula. I think they are just so cute. Um, 
you know, they're beautiful, beautiful people, and they are also smart and they're athletic and talented players. Uh, and I'm here for it. So very excited for them. No, oh, absolutely. And I just, I think it's hysterical because especially now in today's day and age, a lot of people like soft launch things like a little yeah. pick here, a little something like, like and Not this, yeah, exactly. It's like, um, <laughs> You know, try and throw tidbits in the game, play the game of like, okay, like maybe show like a hand or yeah, something. yeah, you got holding the hand with the back of the head, whatever. And right. they're, they're dancing, they're you know, tying to suppose man bun. I mean, they're going full in, like you said, I'm pretty, <laughs> they both look happy. It's another thing I think it's great for the game because anything that can get more spotlight on tennis, yeah, I think it's great. And it makes it they're two very high level players. Um, I think it's something I think it could be good for them too. Not only is it entertaining for us to watch and see where it goes, but it's it's like you're on tour, like like you said. It, it shows how lonely you could get um, if you're not with friends, family. If you are with them, it's they can't always come with you. So it's nice that you know they won't always be at the same tournaments, obviously. But these majors, where it's the women's and the men's side, it's nice that they'll have somebody to uh, you know kind of have their back always, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely, and not not only that, but I think they're also practice partners, which is also super convenient. So no, it's too. I mean, it's a good practice part, uh, good practice partner to have both ways, obviously, too. So. Yeah. Very Definitely. much so. And then getting into another top story actually dropped today um, is Wozniacki returning to the game, I think, which is a great for tennis, great for the women's side. I, what's kind of your thoughts on that, the way she did it, her just coming back in general? You know what? We've watched her over the past few years. She's had two kids, but she stayed in incredible shape. She looked like a fitness model this entire time. We've seen her actually play tennis a bunch over the past couple of years. And, um, you know, I really like her message behind this campaign. She said, uh, you know, guys, you know, they can start families with their wives and they can have kids. Roger has four kids. Novak has two kids. Roger or Rafa, one kid. And, um, you know, their careers are not affected. They can still travel. They can still play. But obviously women's are. They got to take some time off. And she gave a lot of credit to Serena, Azarenka and Kleister. She said these women have all done it. They've had kids and they've come back to tour and they've put up a fight and they you know, were successful on tour. She said, I want to change that narrative of women just, you know, being one or the other, an athlete or a mom. She said, I want to be both. I want to be a successful mom and I want to come back and be a successful tennis player. And I'm so excited to watch her make this comeback and return to the tour. No, absolutely. I think, like you said, for just women in general, I think it's great for younger women seeing they could do it. Women on tour saying, you know, I could, if I want, I could step back and, you know, focus on my, uh, in my personal life, which is important because I'm sure there's so many, you know, women on the WTA tour right now that are like, I can't stop. It's like, this is it. This is all I could do. Forget a family right now. Forget, uh, you know, family, forget relationships, yada, yada. And it just shows that, hey, you can step back for a little bit, do what you have to do, take care of what's important to you at that time and hop back in the game and still be successful and make it happen. And just, I mean, the way she did it, I like a good uh, announcement or entrance, everything. Yeah. When Jordan's co I'm coming back to something like this, I think it's great. It's exciting. So it's, it's great for the game. Happy for her. It's going to be great to have her back on tour. Absolutely. So, Rachel, I think we're at the end here of episode one. Had a great time. I'm looking forward for Wimbledon to get started. So it gives us more to speak about for episode two. Thank you guys for listening and we'll see you next week. See you guys next week. <laughs>